Um, happy to be here, and uh, I have a presentation that's similar to one that I gave at the IMF where it took an hour and a half, but I understand I only have an hour, so I'm counting on this audience being 30% smarter than an audience of the IMF, so that should be easy. Um, but I am going to go relatively quickly um, through what I'm, with what is a very ambitious sort of paper because it's not actually presenting to you something that I have worked out and finalized. It's presenting something to you that I think there's a puzzle that has yet to be resolved and on which I am working. So rather than saying I've worked out this uh, uh, very precise estimate of something, I'm rather saying there's a big picture question out there that hasn't been adequately addressed and I'm groping towards sort of a solution to what I think is an important problem. So what I'm searching for is a grand unified theory of growth, which is, so far, we have a bunch of boutique theories of growth, but we really don't have any theory that can explain anything like the range of phenomena about economic growth that are of interest. So that's the first thing we, I want to talk about. And first thing I want to talk about is, what are the facts that would need that a unified theory would need to explain? What are the facts about growth in the world such that we would need a theory that would be capable of explaining and generating those facts? Um, which leads me to sort of the basic outlines of such a theory would be what I call the states in transition growth theories. Um, then we want to move to the question of in such a theory, what role would policy play? How would one think about promoting more rapid economic growth in such a model, um, which turns out to be quite tricky because it turns out the word policy is completely misunderstood. And hence, we need, I need to redefine what policy means, and in particular, distinguish what policy might mean in a rules world from what policy means in a deals world. And acknowledge that a key feature of what it means to be a developing country is that there's a huge gap between policy as designed and policy as implemented. And into that gap creeps all the interesting features about the dynamics of capitalism. So, which means we need a sort of to worry about if we're going to have a theory of the dynamics of capitalism, we have to have a theory of the dynamics of the capability for policy implementation. Which, we need, which means we need to talk about the dynamics of state capability, um, which leads us into uh, a sort of fourth area that's needed. Then we are going to get briefly into what uh, Ricardo, how my colleague Ricardo Hausman has did, been doing and what we mean by structural transformation. And then finally, we can come back to linking the dynamics of what a growth theory needs to look like, what policy looks like, what state capability and its dynamics are with a theory of structural transformation. So we're off to the races. So basic, the first section is, you know, if you thought I was going to have a theory of electron behavior, you would want to say, well, what is the behavior of the electron that you sort of are interested in? What would your theory, what's the empirical phenomena that you would want your theory to be capable of generating such that you then would say, yeah, I have an adequate theory of how electrons behave. Well, with growth, the problem is, is that we have four very big facts about growth that don't fit very well together in any one theory of growth. So I'm going to run through those four facts. The first big fact is that the OECD, by and large, has had incredibly stable economic growth. Um, to some extent, you can't really have a very useful theory about the growth in the OECD because it's a theory of nothing happening. So if I took um, Denmark's GDP per capita from 1890 to 1901, I run the simplest possible log GDP on a time trend, and I forecast the level of Denmark's GDP 100 years ahead. You might say, oh, economists can't forecast anything. How could you possibly forecast anything? Turns out, I could forecast Denmark's GDP 100 years ahead to within a tiny percentage. So literally, this trend line, extrapolated for 100 years, gives me exactly 
than Denmark's GDP in 2003. Now what that means is the underlying growth rate of the Danish economy hasn't changed since 1890. Which means any theory we have about Danish GDP has to roughly be invariant to everything that's happened since 1890. Okay, that's the first big fact and the first big sort of fact that a theory has to confront. The second big fact <laughs> is that it's sort of the opposite. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, looks like your theory of growth is going to explain something like 100 years or whatever. Well, are you, going to, are you going to say something, state some facts about 1,000 or 2,000 years? No. <laughs> nothing more than 100. Because basically, the, if you read, basically nothing interesting about growth happened for thousands of years. Growth, per capita growth of GDP was absolutely zero for thousands of years. So to some extent, I don't have a theory of the, in what happened was the Industrial Revolution, and there's been one kink, but after that kink, there's nothing. So I don't have any theory prior to the Industrial Revolution. Um, but to some extent, that's also, that's also, in some sense, really boring, because for the thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution, nothing much happened. So, um, which, by the way, is sort of, <laughs> uh, you know, the only sense in which I have a long-run theory is the second fact is about if you look at the current levels of GDP per capita of the now poorest countries, the levels of GDP per capita of the, are so close to what anything like subsistence must be, it must mean that the current levels of GDP per capita are roughly at Adam and Eve levels or whatever your culturally relevant forebearers, when they walked out of into being human beings, they had roughly Tanzania's current GDP per capita. Because these are just as low a levels as you can get and still have demographically sustainable populations. So if you say, how much, how fast could these countries have possibly grown since 1870? The answer is they're so close to subsistence they must have grown very, very slowly. So an order of magnitude more slowly than Denmark over the last sort of historical trip. So to some extent, you have to have a theory that's capable of poverty traps, and you have to have a theory capable of poverty traps because some countries are demonstrably in a poverty trap up until quite recently, and may well still be in one. So that's the second big fact. The second big fact is there's a set of countries that, so there's a set of countries, about 20 of them, that have grown at 2% very stably for a very long time. There's another set of countries that have grown, that have never had sustained per capita growth in their entire history. <coughs> so we have to have that. The third, and this is, uh, you know, just to go back, this is the only sense in which we take data back, is if you look at what the current level, so if you ask yourself, when did, you know, when did the Netherlands, which was the world's leading us economy before 1800, when did it have GDP per capita equivalent to what we now observe in the currently poor countries? The answer is, you know, through crude extrapolation that's, that's not very accurate, because the further back in history we go, the less accurate it is, but Haiti had, Netherlands had Haiti's GDP in the year 1469. So basically, if you think of Haiti's GDP today, it's roughly what would have existed in sort of pre, you know, Pre-history, the pre-modern history of the Netherlands, the, what we think of in some ways as the creation of the modern European state system in 1648. Already, you know, more than 10% of the world's countries are poorer than the Netherlands was at the Peace of Westphalia. So they're sort of must be at very, very low levels of growth. Um, now, the 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 thing with those two facts is they characterize small sets of countries at the top and the bottom of the income distribution. But what actually characterizes the growth behavior of most countries in the middle is not a stable growth rate, but high volatility. So there's just massive lack of persistence of growth rates. So whereas you think of countries having high growth and low growth, what really happens is most, most countries not cycle, but move back and forth in episodic in episodic fashion between periods of super high growth, periods of super low growth. So what, what, and I have to draw on the board here, but so what I did is if you just take 
Um, just take any country's sort of GDP per capita data, um, and then it, it sort of goes like this, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a 10-year sort of filter through this data and calculate every 10-year growth rate. So I'm just going to calculate 10-year growth rates smoothing this series. And then I'm going to classify the, those 10-year growth rates into where it falls in the world distribution of growth rates. So the world distribution of growth rates is centered on 2% per capita per annum, right? Um, with a standard deviation of roughly 2. So I divide the possible growth rates up into sort of standard deviation units. So this is two standard deviations above the mean, this is two standard deviations below the mean, this is sort of, you get it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm just, I, I, uh, so then what, I, then what I say is, what fraction of your 10-year episodes of, the, of any given country were you in this growth rates, these growth rates, or these growth rates? And what the OECD looks like is they spend all of their time in moderate growth. All of the episodes of Great Britain, no time in collapse, no time in stagnation, sort of mostly in moderate growth, no time in rapid growth, no time in boom. So the distribution of Great Britain's growth rates was very narrowly centered, right? But that is the opposite of what most countries experience. What most countries experienced is that they moved between boom and bust, which is they spent, take Ghana for instance, Ghana spent 7% of its time shrinking at more than 2% per, per capita per, per year, and spent 11% of its time growing at 6% per year. So in some sense, the distribution of growth rates in Ghana was wider than the distribution of growth rates across countries in the world. There was more variance to the growth rate of Ghana than there was variance of growth rates across countries in the world. So Ghana was less like itself than the world was like it, or some weird way of saying that. But basically, there was just no single number that kind of characterizes Ghana's growth behavior. It went back and forth between boom and bust, and spent some time at every point in between. So Great Britain and Ghana had exactly the same growth rate over the, over the sort of 1955 to 2007 period. Exactly the same average growth rate to within a decimal point, but a completely different growth experience. So Ghana sort of had massive cyclicality, huge boom, huge bust, long period of stagnation, resumption of growth. So if you say, well, Ghana's growth rate was 2%, what have you communicated about Ghana's growth experience? Well, you've communicated its long run average, but you haven't communicated anything about its dynamics or its volatility or what really happened during very extended periods of Ghana's history. So then if you calculate what these are, is this is a graph of the world distribution of growth rates. So this is, if we take all countries in the world and their five-year growth overlapping periods for all countries in the world, this is the distribution of growth rates in the world. This is the distribution of growth rates in Britain. Britain has a distinctive experience of being all concentrated here, but this is the distribution of growth experiences in Ghana. So you see that the distribution in Ghana has fatter tails, has more variance than the distribution of the world at large. I'm not sure people are staring at me like, is this too obvious? This is not the way most people think about growth. Most people think about growth as a country has a growth rate and it's relatively persistent. So I feel I have to convince you that that's the wrong characterization of growth. If we have to have a theory of growth, it shouldn't be a theory that's primarily about explaining growth characteristics in terms of a country characteristics um, because the growth is so volatile over time within a country that the growth characteristics can't do a very good job of explaining. The country characteristics can't essentially explain much of the growth experience of a country. Okay. Fourth big fact is that some countries have had super rapid growth. And again, these countries are all famous and we talk about them all the time, but it turns out they're famous and we talk about them all the time because there's so few of them. 
It turns out there's really only a handful of countries that have had extended episodes of very rapid growth. So depending on where you say extended and what you say very rapid, you get different lists, but um, uh, the Growth Commission, for instance, tried to look at what do we learn from the successful growers, and they only identified 13 total countries that had you know, extended periods of rapid growth. Um, there are only uh, there are only eight countries that spent more than half of their time in growth episodes of higher than four percent per annum. Yeah. Are there any countries which have experienced extended rapid negative growth? Oh yeah. Venezuela, for instance, is. But, I mean, are there are the numbers pretty much the same for positive and negative growth? Mm -hmm. No, but but in meaning in part because ne uh, negative growth is bounded below much more so than positive growth is bounded above. So some countries in Africa, for instance, have suffered collapse and then just stopped because there's only so low you can go. Uh, so it, you can't really sustain eight percent collapse for thirty years because. <laughs> You know, you you, you, I mean, there are biological limits to how low GDP can be before people migrate or just... So anyway, so, so but there are, in fact, I mean, Venezuela, for instance, uh, has had sort of negative 2% growth uh, for on the order of 25 years, from 1973 to, uh, well, 1973 to even today, they've been on its sort of cumulative decline, so their GDP has declined from being probably 25% above Spain's in the mid-1970s to being sort of a third of Spain's today. So there have been countries that have had persistent decline. Is that, was that your question? But it can't be this fast and can't be this long because you just, you hit a lower limit. Okay, so now what, what this leads to is that uh, this is from a paper of mine in which what we did is we sort of looked at countries' growth rate experiences, and then we tried to episode, we, we identified episodes of acceleration. So where the graph sort of looked like that, where there was a discrete acceleration in which the growth rate was faster in this period than it was before. Um, and then we could characterize what happened before your acceleration, what happened, and what happened after your deceleration. So, we can then classify countries that had negative growth before their acceleration, had at least a seven year period of rapid growth, but then had negative growth after the acceleration. So for instance, Ghana in 1965, which we've already seen, if you look at Ghana's graph, it had negative growth, it had an extended period of rapid growth, followed by another extended period of negative growth. So Ghana went Ghana, this is Ghana 65, before 65 was negative, 65 to the mid 70s it was positive, 70s on it was negative. So if we look at its growth experience, it was negative, positive, negative, right? And some countries had sort of positive growth, a growth acceleration, and then more positive growth after. So growth was above average before their acceleration, they accelerated, and then it remained above average, not necessarily as fast as during the acceleration after. So it turns out Finland, uh, in 19, oh, Finland in 1967. I know absolutely nothing about Finland other than its abbreviation is FIN. So I could be completely wrong, but what the data says is that Finland had above average growth before 67, had enough of an acceleration it classified as an acceleration, and then continued in above average growth after 67. Okay? Now, the interesting question for a general unified theory of growth would be, why do some countries experience growth accelerations and other countries not experience growth accelerations? And why do some countries' growth accelerations end badly, that is, in a subsequent collapse, and why do some countries' growth accelerations sustain themselves? So it's not a theory of levels of growth as a steady state phenomena, it's a theory of episodes of growth. Why do countries go from stagnation to positive growth, and then why do they sustain? Now, my sort of, what the answer in some sense must look like, which doesn't tell us what the answer is, but it tells us what we should be looking for, 
is it must look like that there's some probabilistic transition across states of growth, and then there's a within-state dynamics of your growth, and that these two sort of laws of motion needn't be the same thing. Now, I don't know how much of you have done growth theory, but this is exactly the opposite of what growth theory does. What growth theory does is it writes down a single linear equation of motion in which your growth is a sum function of your adaptive to your long-run steady state, and then that's that. That description of your growth dynamics is a basically single sort of state and adjustment dynamics to that state. So you may have, you may have a level of output that's determined by some fundamentals, then your growth is adjustment towards that level of output. What I'm saying is, is that that single linear dynamics describing growth with, with levels of GDP we condition on factors can't actually be a very good description of a unifying theory of growth because it can't handle, in some sense, all of the volatility and episodic nature of growth that we observe. Um, so what we, would, what we need is sort of a theory of what these probabilistic transitions look like and what the within-state dynamics look like. Am I, so, for instance, <laughs> let's say I took the six categories I have and I label those categories, then what we have is uh, a model of the probability that you transit from any given state of growth to any other state of growth. So, for instance, um, this probability for Great Britain, the probability that I'm in a state of moderate growth and I remain in a state of moderate growth, must be very near one, because Great Britain spent nearly all of it, 80% of its time in this state, right? On the other hand, for, uh, on the other hand, for Ghana, we know that the probability that it's in a boom and transits to a collapse must actually be pretty high, because it did it a couple of times. So even though it was growing at 8%, it didn't stay in the growth period of 8%. It shifted from 8% down to negative 2%. You know, in a quite discrete fashion. It wasn't a gradual transition. But we also know there's some countries that have managed to keep themselves in this state for a very long time. So China, for instance, has managed to keep the probability of being in a boom and staying in a boom high enough that it stayed in a boom for an extended period. And there, and there must be countries that managed to stay pretty near here for a very long time. So what we have would be a theory of what's the probability of the state you're in and what's the probability you stay in the state you're in. Yeah? What is the unified growth theory? What? I I mean So mostly when you talk about a unified theory of growth, it depends on what dynamics of the scale you're talking about, right? So most unified theories of growth they, they unify sort of over centuries, right? <laughs> what, and, and I use the theory of unified growth deliberately because in physics, as you know, there are like various forces and they act over different scales. And what theory has been trying to do is unify them over increasing scales, right? So what all the sort of unified theories of growth do is they unify sort of the huge extended domain of like what explains why some countries are rich and what's, why some countries are poor, but actually don't say anything about the short to medium run dynamics. So don't say anything about why a country would in fact be in a boom. I mean, and it just empirically when you flesh them out, they just don't have any predictions about that because they have too few, they have too few states and too few transitions of states. So oftentimes theories of super long run growth like have one transition. You have a transition from a poverty trap into steady state growth, and that's the transition you would explain. So like Greg Clark's work as an economic historian, you know, in Greg Clark's view, if you look over thousands of years, right, there's only one event in history that matters. Uh, you know, if you look at, you know, British GDP from 1,000 to today, the graph looks like this, right? It was flat for a thousand years, then they had the Industrial Revolution and it took off and it grew like that. So the only thing a theory of growth has to explain is why that happened, right? What I'm saying is, is that at this scale, 
in the developing countries, all the action is at time frequencies sort of higher than what the typical macroeconomic cyclical theories explain. Uh, I mean, longer than what typical macroeconomic theories deal with, but much shorter than the existing growth theories deal with. Because the existing growth theories are mostly steady state theories. And by being steady state theories, they explicitly rule out being able to have a rich theory of dynamics. Yeah. So of course, if we have even a richer theory of dynamics, allowing more states, uh, then with enough states, you can explain everything, basically. Right? Yeah. But is that a theory, or no. is that a description of the data? <laughs> exactly. Um, no, so that's what we want. What we want is to have sort of parsimonious enough, but rich enough to explain the data. Right? We know having only within state, so, so the thing is, is that <clears throat> what, what a states and transitions model would be, is you would, I mean, think of water, right? How does water behave? Well, we have really good theories of, of motion, of how water behaves, right? And how water is going to behave under various conditions. And we know if we pick up a bucket of water and turn it upside down, the water is going to flow out in certain ways. Well, yes, if the water happens to be in the state of being a fluid. But we also know that water undergoes state transitions. And we know that waterfalls fall, and we can predict the acceleration of water really accurately, unless the waterfall freezes. And then when the waterfall freezes, then the equations of motion of water change completely. So <clears throat> yes, if we, if we said every behavior requires a new state to explain it, and we have infinite states, that's not a theory. But on the other hand, there's nothing about any physical process that says you have to have a one-state theory. No physical process of, in science has a one-state theory. We have equations of motion that depend on the states. Now, how many states do we need? That's a hard question. Do we need four states? Do we need six states? I don't know yet, right? But I know we need more than one, because the empirics of one-state growth models just can't fit the even basic stylized fact about the data. Um, Maybe we, and we need at least three, because we need at least zero OECD and rapid, because we've seen countries spend extended periods in at least those three states. We probably need a fourth, which is negative. So I, I would guess we're headed for a four state theory. Um, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. But what I, what I am pretty sure of is that we, we ought to be headed for a theory like this, that and again, what, what the existing theories of growth are is mostly growth theories of within state dynamics, assuming a single state. And then there's an adjustment dynamics to the long run equilibrium that's determined by these underlying factors, and that these underlying factors and these underlying factors are roughly the same. Okay. So now, <clears throat> so what we would kind of like, uh, and, and the, only, the, the, the point being is that, like, if, you've, if you're a like, growth theorist about OECD countries, right, it's kind of boring, because you kind of have to explain why they grew at zero, and they're now growing at two and have for 120 years. If you're a growth theorist and you're in development, it's really exciting, because there's lots more going on in the data than just a sort of single steady state of two, um, and why it's two as opposed to one, and all of those questions. What we would sort of like is sort of to give sensible answers to, if at time zero this happens, what's going to be the evolution of the level of output, such that we derive from that a theory of growth based on the dynamics of output as sort of impulse response functions to various events. That would be a desirable thing to have, particularly if you're interested in development policy, because you get asked questions like, if we do this, will growth go up or down? Uh, and steady state theories are mostly useless for that. Um, because steady state theories make predictions about sort of growth rates over very long time scales. Whereas what people are mostly interested in for policy is what these sort of impulse response function dynamics look like with respect to growth. So, <clears throat> that's the first section. I'm going way too, believe it or not, I'm going way too slow. <laughs> so, the second section I'm going to is is I want to emphasize what we want is a theory that might map actions in the world like policy changes or policies to output dynamics of countries. Now, the problem is, is that 
the metaphor of policy has been that policy is a rule. And what is a rule? A rule is a mapping. A rule is a mapping from realized states of the world to actions by an agent of the state. That might not be how you normally describe a policy, but that's kind of what it is. If you think of what a tax policy is, it's what's your income, that's how much tax you have to pay. It's a mapping from a state of the world to an action. Now, the difficulty is, is that <clears throat> what in some sense we mean by a developing country is that there's massive divergence between the official policy and the actual policy. So just to take one example of like a really micro concrete example, uh, people studied the process of getting a driver's license in New Delhi, India. The policy for getting a driver's license in India looked exactly like the policy for getting a driver's license anywhere in the world. You go in to an agency, you prove your identity, you prove whatever juridical facts about your age, you then prove you can drive, and the state issues an authorization that authorizes you to drive legally. Right? The de facto what happened is as you head into that agency, there are people outside the building who will act as your agent in getting you the driver's license. And if you hire an agent, there was only a 12% probability you actually took the legally required driving exam. Not because you could drive, but because you had hired an agent to facilitate the process who bought you out of compliance with the original policy. Complete. If you didn't hire an agent, the law actually got enforced, and they enforced the policy that was on the books, and they made you take a driving exam. Most people who didn't pay a bribe to an agent and took the driving exam failed, in part because they were saying, you're too stupid to know how to get a driver's license in this country. Why didn't you hire one of the guys outside the building <laughs> to get the driver's license? Um, but also because many of them didn't know how to drive because they went back and tested these people. These people didn't know how to drive. So two-thirds of these people had no driving skills at all, in spite of now having the legal authorization to drive. So in a, what happens is there's the de jure policy, which is this rule that maps from states of the world to actions by agents of the state. But then these agents of the state actually take their own choices and produce a realized policy, the actual actions by the agents of the state. And that's influenced by a lot of things that condition the choices of agents. And what happens in a developing country is this and this aren't brothers, aren't sisters, aren't cousins, don't even talk to each other. The gap between the policy on the books and the policy of what's implemented can be night and day. So um, I'm skipping through some of these examples. So <clears throat> let's move to economic policy. So the World Bank went out and did this survey of how long it would take you to do various measures of regulatory compliance as a way of measuring what they said was the investment climate. And the climate's a good metaphor because the climate sort of affects everybody the same, right? Finland's cold and Finland's cold and everybody in Finland is cold, right? Well, the beauty of the World Bank is it's this big disorganized place. So they also went out and actually asked firms how long it actually took them to comply with regulations. So this is how long it would have taken you to get a construction permit according to the World Bank's data on how long it would take you, assuming you were in legal compliance. And this is how long it actually took you. Of firms that actually got a construction permit, how long they said it actually took them to get the permit. Now, it doesn't take super sophisticated analysis to see this is a pretty flat relationship, right? There's almost zero correlation between how long firms said it took them and how long the World Bank said the law said it would take them if they complied with the law. Now, there are multiple interpretations of that. One is that <clears throat> this number uh, is badly collected. And the, uh, and the other is most firms that are doing business in these countries aren't complying with the law. And that the degree of non-compliance gets higher the more costly it would be to actually be in compliance. And so what you end up with countries where the, the deviation between the average time and the legal time, this would be the, if you know, they're full, complete, and uniform legal compliance, the points would be along this 45 degree line. Instead, the difference is like almost a year 
between what they say the law in Brazil says and what firms in Brazil say they do. Okay. Now, the other interesting point about this is <clears throat> by doing a survey and asking firms, you have also have multiple responses. So if you look at just, this is just among African countries, this is the distribution within each country between the 10th percentile of firms in terms of how long it took them to, uh, this is to get an operating license, not a construction permit. There were three different indicators we used. And basically, the 10th percentile of firms say didn't take any time at all. Like, no time. One day, two days. The 90th percentile of firms said it took them all over the map. So, based in, um, let's choose a country. So, in Zambia, the 10th percentile of firms said it took them, I think this is uh, two days. And the, yeah, and the 90th percentile firm said it took them 90 days. So the gap between the 90th and 10th percentile was 88 days. Now, what the implication of this is that <clears throat> this is the average days firms said it took them. The entire range across all countries was 20 days. So in nearly every country, the gap in compliance time between the most, the fastest firm and slowest firm was larger within a country than the entire range between countries. Meaning, if you want to know how long it's going to take you to get a license, who you are is much more important than where you are. Because where you are is determines kind of the shape of this distribution. Who you are determines whether what tails you're at or what you do, right? And what we see about this variance is that then if we relate this variance to the law, we, we validate a saying that's been attributed to various Latin American dictators. For my friends, anything. For my enemies, the law. Meaning, if I have a sufficiently restrictive regulatory environment, all I need to do in order to do you a favor is to grant you deviation from compliance with the law, and if I want to punish you, all I have to do is make you follow the law. So this is the graph between legal days and the 10th percentile. This is the graph between legal days and the 25th percentile. So if we look at what difference it would make to a country observed at having a regulatory environment at 600, at 480 days versus 80 days, it would change the 25th percentile response by four days. So 400 days difference in the law, four days difference in the practice. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the 75th or 90th percentile, we see that for my friends, anything, for my enemies, the law, right? They actually do have a, a, at least a, a range of the data over which the law creates more and more delays, and in which, in fact, the worst delayed firms are delayed even more than what the law said you would take. You're even above the 45 degree line. So this just means there's a massive gap between what firms actually experience in terms of policy, in policy implementation of regulation and we do this graph for three different indicators for which we can compare it to exactly the same type of results. No correlation on average. The within-country variance is much, much larger than the cross-country variance, and that the, the low percentiles of firms have zero compliance times, and the high percentile firms have massive compliance times even higher than what's legally stated. So what this means in my view, it just is that it, it's really, um, it, it's a deals world. <laughs> if you think about what it's like to do business in a country that doesn't have solid institutions of policy implementation, what it means is what will happen to you as a firm depends on who you are and what you do, not what the law says. So that's a deal. That's a individual and firm-specific arrangement that has nothing necessarily to do 
with the law <coughs> and has everything to do with the deals that are available. Now, then we could ask, <clears throat> well, what's going to be the role of policy reform of the type of reform in de jure policy in a deals world? I don't know. Could be anything. Because if there's no connection between policy as written on the books and policy as practiced, I may be able to change the policy on the books massively and not have any change in the practice. Um, for the few countries for which we have sort of time series where we have an enterprise survey at two different points and a doing business survey at two different points, um, if the 45 degree line in this diagram is this line here, so if we thought policy reform and reducing the legal compliance days drove down uh, reported compliance times one for one, the data should align on this line. Now, some countries it looks like that's kind of what happens. You reduce the compliance days and the compliance days go down. Many other countries look like this, <laughs> or like this, or like this, where you reduce the legal compliance times and the actual compliance times go up. It all depends on how the policy implementation was actually happening. So there cannot be any predicted relationship between policy reform and growth if policy reform is measured as changing the law if what precisely is what is his issue is the capability to enforce the law. So in a deals world, who knows what will happen when you change the rules, right? So <clears throat> it could, could do anything, um, which by the way, has the benefit of being consistent with the evidence, <laughs> which is, you know, we're, we've been puzzled for a long time that lots of countries had policy reform and it didn't result in any growth payoff. Well, if you were in this situation where policy reform actually increased compliance times, you shouldn't have necessarily expected any growth payoff. Um, now, section three I'm going to skip over really quickly um, because it's not that... I'm going to skip over this just because it's not super. It's not super critical to the flow of discussion. It's really fun and it had pictures of snakes in it, so um, had to have been fun. But uh, basically, it, it sets us up for section four. The basic message of the section I just skipped is that when we look at measures of state capability for policy implementation, they have very slow, very persistent dynamics. So state capability doesn't change very fast. Okay. Now, you, the, smart, the smartest of you have just realized that we have a problem. One of our theories about long-run growth is that long-run levels of sustainable output are, are highly dependent on something called the quality of institutions. But we know the quality of institutions, however measured, evolves very slowly. But we know that growth dynamics are very volatile. Well, now we got a problem. Because we know that we can't make, I mean, a fundamental principle of econometrics is you can't make smooth stuff explain squiggly stuff. At least that's how I learned it. If you've got a time series variable that's doing this, and another time series variable that's doing that, it can be very tough to attribute much of the variation to this very smoothly evolving thing. So that's precisely the puzzle we have. Um, oh, just a second, I had to show you some pictures. I gotta show you some pictures first. Okay, so let's go to section five and then we'll skip back up to section, my new section four. So, so basically what we have is if we look at, if we look at sort of, and I'm sorry I even have this graph, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. Um, so it, let's say we take the average of a country's polity score, which is a measure of negative 10 is pure autocracy, positive 10 is pure democracy, and we look at the relationship between a country's average polity score and its growth of GDP per capita. Um, what jumps out at you about this figure? It's not super obvious that 
a positive or negative slope jumps out at you. It, you don't say, oh my god, I want to be a democracy. Um, they, they do kind of, democracies do grow faster, but they have a much lower variance. So all of the episodes of rapid growth happened in autocracies, basically, other than Ireland and Mauritius. But all of the episodes of rapid growth happened in countries that were less than fully democratic. That's just a fact of the matter. Um, and then if we do the, the, the same thing for the volatility of growth, we actually find a stronger relationship between the volatility of growth, and what's the volatility of growth is, and, or my measure of the volatility of growth is I take the country's sort of time series of growth, and then I measure its most negative and its, its biggest difference in absolute terms, and that's your volatility of growth, right? So the volatility of growth is much larger for countries that are autocratic than countries that are democratic. And let's get off of that and on to measures of uh, institutional quality. And so if we take a measure of average corruption, what we actually see is that here are, you know, wow, look at this. Again, I, all I know about Finland is it's abbreviated FIN. And you guys have the highest control of corruption in the world. Is that really true? <laughs> really not corrupt? I guess when you walk on the street, you don't even cross against the light. So that must be really rule compliant. Anyway, but what is true of countries that control corruption is that they have a low variance in growth rate. But if you look at countries with massive corruption, you actually see massive variation in the growth rate. The volatility of growth is very high. Um, such that if you then say, if we regress measures of institutions on measures of, if we measure the level income on the level of institutions, we get very high R squareds. But if we measure the growth on institutions, we get very, very low R squareds. Again, in keeping with the fundamental principle that smooth lines can't explain squiggly lines, we can't get any action of either the initial level of institutions or changes in institutions to explain much of um, the variation in growth rates. So to some extent, we have to have, and this is now what the dynamics of capitalism means, we have to have a model in which we have institution traps, in which you can get bursts of growth during periods when you have weak institutions, but that when you have weak of institutions, those bursts of growth don't necessarily lead to better institutions, which means that when your growth boom stops, it unravels and you go back to the same or lower level of GDP than you started. So you could see you could have a combined institution poverty trap if, in fact, growth booms worsened your institutions. So one steady state is a combined institution trap poverty trap. Another steady state is a set of positive developmental dynamics where positive institution sh shifts lead to higher in income and higher income leads to positive institution dynamics. To some extent, we have to have this because the developed countries of the world have been in this state for a long, long time. Institutions have been getting better and growth has been steady, right? So level of income has been going up. Um, at the same time, we have to have something like this because we know that institutions aren't getting very much better and we know that are countries that are still at very, very low levels. And then the interesting question is, do we have any theory of the transition? What accounts for why some countries make it out of a poverty institution trap into a developmental dynamic and other countries don't? Okay, now, in a deals world, here is what I think is something like uh, the answer which is, what we know is that in a deals world, the rules don't matter, but the rules could be more or less conducive for growth, and the rules can be more or less, con the way in which the deviation from the rules is reconciled can produce more or less pressure for the improvement of institutions. So, now let's think of a typology of deals environments 
in which I'm going, to cl I'm going to classify deals according to two characteristics. One is whether the deal is open, and one is whether the deals are closed, and one is whether the deals are ordered, and the other is whether the deals are disordered. Right? Now, open ordered deals is like driver's licenses in Delhi. It's corrupt, but it's corrupt for everybody. You pay the fee, you get the driver's license, and it's ordered. Once you have the driver's license, you can drive. There's no risk to having, any, having bribed your way into a driver's license. The cop who stops you will bribe you just the same if you bought the driver's license or didn't buy the driver's license. So there's no risk of the deal, right? Disordered deals are deals in which anyone can engage in it, but there's a risk to it. So you could, you know, be expropriated in a variety of ways ex post. So sort of low discount rate, high discount rate about whether the deal stays done. And then ordered, closed ordered deals are what we call a variety of names, but cronyism is a good word for it, in which there's a tight link that the deals are actually only available to specific individuals. Right? Not everyone can walk in and get the oil pipeline contract. <laughs> Right? It's not retail corruption. So who gets the oil deal pipeline contract? Oil pipeline contract is not determined according to rules. It's according to the deals. But it, the deal is not open to everyone. It may well be um, closed. Uh, and you may know ex ante. Um, I lived for two years in Indonesia. And closed ordered deals was exactly the description of the regime under Suharto. If you were going to do big business in Suharto, you knew you had to be in bed with one of four players. Suharto's family, the military, one or two of the Chinese conglomerates, or one set of local investors. If you weren't in bed with one of those four people, you couldn't do business in Indonesia at any scale. Okay. Why wouldn't the market work in that situation? Why wouldn't the, the the oil producer who is most efficient or, or capable in producing whatever, and therefore willing to pay the most for the... No one says they wouldn't. But who gets the rents? Perhaps it's the Shohanto family, but, but nevertheless, I mean, it would lead to efficiency, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, I was thinking that, uh, I was thinking that this is a theory of, of why there are, why there is no Growth or, or no, what's no, no. Oh, so it's no. <laughs> I mean, Indonesia under Suharto had one of the most rapid periods of growth in history. Okay. This is a theory of the dynamics of capitalism, which includes periods of high growth and periods of low growth. And precisely my point is that this is consistent with very rapid growth. Because after all, what do capitalists want? They want high and secure profits. What can give them high and secure profits? Rules can give them high and secure profits when you have strong institutions. But what give you high and secure profits when they have weak institutions are closed order deals. So Russia under Putin, which is a continuing state, has had very high growth. Right? So partly the dynamics I want to get to is precisely that. So, so now, if you think of the growth dynamics, the growth dynamics are positive, massively positive, moving this direction. So if you go from fragile states, where you might buy the pipeline deal but they'll renege a year later, to Putin, who can really promise you the pipeline for a long time, you'll pay much more for it, so you'll have a much more rapidly growing economy. So precisely my theory is movement this direction produces rapid bursts of growth even within weak institutions. But then think about what the dynamics of institutions are. Meaning, is institutional quality getting better or worse? What closed order deals depend on is that institutions, in any meaningful sense of the word, stay weak. Right? So what I'm, what I'm headed for is a theory of how, at weak institutions, you can get very rapid growth, but deterioration of institutions, such that you, when that growth boom <coughs> ends, it doesn't necessarily end in a happy continuation of growth. It can end in a boom that completely reverses the previous growth, which was dependent on 
not institutional enforcement of the market, but on personalistic enforcement of market transactions, which can be perfectly efficient as long as the person can deliver what they promise. But they don't have any institutional backing of those promises. Right? So what you get is a dynamics in which you can be in uh, sort of closed order deals, right? And get perfectly good growth, but you're actually not improving quality of institutions. Because who is in the who is lobbying, who is who who has political power wants better institutions in a closed order deal environment? Nobody. So the dynamics are weaker institutions, even during periods of rapid growth. So this is how the dynamics turns out. And the question is how you avoid this chaotic dynamics of staying down here and make transitions from deals to rules. So this is the transitional regime. So what we have is we have a variety of countries that live in rules environments, a variety of countries that live in deals environments, Within the deals environment, we have hugely volatile growth rates. And all of the growth booms of the world have happened in closed order deals environments. China, Russia, Indonesia, Taiwan. If we name the period in which they initiated the rapid growth, it was all during a period of closed order deals. Right? There was no rules-based transitions to rapid growth. Um, but on the other hand, what we see is countries like Liberia, where you have a closed order deal environment that provided almost the highest per capita income at the time in Africa, followed by when the existing sort of closed order deal environment that had managed to persist collapsed, it collapsed entirely because there was no institutional backing of any environment. So you moved into a period of open, of basically open disordered deals, which was very terrible. So then people battled and drove sort of Liberian GDP. So you then get political delegitimization of the existing form of capitalism, followed by complete collapse, followed by, you know, res restoration of the democratic regime in Liberia. And now ask yourself, would you invest in Liberia now? Well, $16 billion worth of people say yes. <laughs> what would they invest in? Well, they would invest in natural resources. So if you think of the structure of the Liberian economy, and you think if you classify the industries into high rent industries and competitive industries, and export industries and domestic, market indus domestic markets, what you, what you think, what you realize is that there's high rent export, which is the natural resource sector. Then there's industries in the domestic sector where you can create, um, we, you can create rents by putting yourself in a favored position vis-a-vis -vis the regulatory environment. I create a set of rules such that I buy my way out of the rules and no one else can. And then I have a favored position. I garner rents and I increase costs for everyone else. Then we have, and we call these the power brokers. Um, this is about 12% of Liberian GDP. About 8% consists of people be competitive in export markets. About 22% of GDP is sitting in the, in the power brokers. And about 60% of GDP sits in the workhorses, who basically are super disadvantaged by these guys. Okay. Trap, trap on. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, in this situation, what is the dynamics of capitalism? It's going to be these guys <laughs> have power, and what do they want? Well, like most people with power, they want more power. And nothing about improving the quality of institutions in Liberia is going to be in these guys' best interest. So what you're going to get is an institution of institutional stagnation or reversion, <coughs> which can be sustained by a boom in this and a transfer of rents to this, but only for a limited period. So um, and these guys have, of course, completely different interests in what they want the regulatory environment to look like. 
And these guys want tight regulation and weak capability of enforcement. So what they want is good-looking laws that aren't enforced, or more particularly, good-looking laws that are selectively not enforced for them, which is the definition of weak, in my mind, of weak capability for policy implementation. So <clears throat> basically what you get is, um, uh, well, what we're headed towards, at least, is a theory in which we can start explaining the dynamics of booms and bust by whether or not the boom originated in sectors that either created institutional reinforcement or institutional deterioration. And if your boom comes from a sector that creates power, political power around uh, managing a closed order deal environment to manage rents, you don't develop the institutions that allow you to move into new sectors, which means your boom will likely end in a very nasty bust. If you happen to get growth out of moving into competitive sectors, then you can get a positive dynamic in which the existing guys in asking government for more productive infrastructure can lead to the productivity of other guys, which can lead to a sustained sort of <clears throat> a sustained uh, boom, right? Um, and you can get the cycling in between because weak institutions mean that you're going to get huge variation between ordered deals and disordered deals, which is going to cause boom and bust cycles. So. Um, it also means that policy reform, as it's usually practiced, is completely at the phenomena. I mean, after all, we can do any policy reform you want and maintain exactly the same actual practices because it's completely determined by implementation. And we also mean that across, uh, we also should recognize that sort of across the board pushes to improve institutions because institutions are good for growth are likely pyrrhic because the elites don't actually want to improve the institutions in the situation in which they're deriving rents from having weak institutions. So, um, yeah. I'll, I will wrap up there in order to slightly end by five, but we can, people can stay and ask questions, can't they? Or do we have to leave the room? <laughs> okay, so I'll, let me stop there. Oh, which happened to be the end of the show. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for discussion. Oh, come on. <laughs> May I ask something myself? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. uh, many of the institutional issues that you, you raised about the, uh, are, are the policy of institutions are, are, are uh, Things you describe, they actually seem to matter to the European sovereign debt crisis. So, uh, what is your prediction according <laughs> to your observations, mm. according to your theory? You never uh, mm. the estimates of your transition metrics. What's what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I I never would have thought that. Um, but to some extent, you know, the euro crisis is the result of twinning together economies that are rule compliant with economies that aren't rule compliant. So you set up you know, a treaty that says, here's how we'll behave. And in some countries like Finland, people assume that then that's how we'll actually behave. And in some countries like Greece, they said, great, these are the rules that, like every other rule in Greece, here's what we work around to do business. So uh, uh, now, by the way, one other fact is that, um, on the other hand, this has been terrifically good for the South. So if you look at the list of rapidly growing countries in the world, they're all in one of two regions. One, East Asia. Two, the, the periphery of Europe. So where we talk about the East Asian stars, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, all of that. The next tier down is always Spain, Ireland, Greece, Portugal. They are the next most rapidly growing set of countries. So, by pre so to some extent, by pre-committing to larger institutions that did have credibility in policy enforcement, I think these countries bought themselves into a regime of rules that isn't available to other countries. So if you ask, 
had Brazil been able to buy in credibly to the EU rules, my guess is Brazil would be twice as rich today as it is, because it would have been able to buy cheaply the institutional credibility. The problem is, is that like they bought it cheaply, benefited massively from having this pre-commitment. After all, you know, in financial terms, their spreads went down on the assumption that they were well-behaved people, and now it's kind of revealed that they're not as well-behaved and rule-oriented as we, that, well, and not as we ever thought. No one ever believed Greece was complying with Maastricht, right? I mean, did anyone believe that? They would admit they believe that. <laughs> anyway, so so how this ends, I don't know. I mean, because it. You know, it is the. I, I suspect that what they just did with this fiscal union is a complete charade. I mean, if, if they couldn't commit to it credibly the first time, why? What's changed deeply that would lead them to be able to credibly commit to it this time? So, what would what, what initiate the transition from deals institution to rules institution? Are there any? Has the IMF <coughs> facilitated the transition? Because IMF is present in Greece. No, but see this is see this this is a really interesting thing. So so the, the so so now you have to distinguish between uh, policies that require implementation and policies that don't require implementation, basically. What the IMF is best at is policies that require no implementation, or policies that require ten smart guys hanging around the central bank to adopt the policy. So either the policy is government capability saving, so you liberalize something, so it actually takes less capability to monitor it, or you, you something that's like tightly controlled by a few people in a central bank. So the institutions in the world that have dramatically improved over time have in fact been central banks. So the problem in the world that the world has left and conquered is inflation. Probably those of you without gray hair probably don't remember when inflation was really a problem because we've just gotten much better at fixing it, in part because we've had institutional improvement about central banks because it's a narrow technocratic domain about which the political elites weren't fighting over rents. Right? So you could say we can have macro stability and whatever rent seems to be want. If you then say things that require implementation intensity like how the money is spent, the IMF has had, or other institutions have had no traction, right? So again, if you think of the Greek problem as being purely a monetary problem, you can hope you can solve it. If you think of the Greek problem as being a productivity problem, because it has weak institutions, yeah, then you're really, then the future looks much less rosy. Now, my own view is that Greece's problem is a productivity problem, not a monetary transactions problem. And so whatever pre-commitments you can make in the short run about monetary transactions, they just belie the problem that Greeks' productivity isn't nearly as high as their consumption. So anyway, question, question, question. Did you have a question? Uh, no. Well, why don't we take three questions? Question, question, question. Okay, um, I just had a, a question about the, the policy implications of this for... And, and, see, already you used the word policy implications. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, though. I mean, I know, I know it's a theory of growth. Um, no, no, but it's a theory of why but, policy can't matter. But, but of course, I mean, you know, if, if I'm a developing country, I'm saying, well, you know, East Asia, that's a pretty good model. But you're saying East Asia is not necessarily a great model because, of course, it's not, right. it's not something that another country can follow. So what, what would be a right. the implications of that? Right. Yeah, uh, going back, back to Africa, yeah. there has been some dispute about whether uh, foreign uh, financial aid yeah. draws out uh, uh, investment in, in infrastructure, public goods right. in African countries. Right. How, how would you uh, uh, think of, of the link between uh, between foreign aid and the institutions which right. you have not discovered? Right. Uh, I was thinking about uh, booms and busts in terms of conflict, I mean, military conflict, yeah. internal and external conflict. Right. I mean, probably large portions of, especially downward spirals, are, can be explained. Uh, Some, in terms of that. Yeah. That's my question is. Right, yeah. How would that relate to your. Opinion? Yeah, okay. So, first question is, you know, the, the, let's think of three levels of policy implementation intensity. 
right? And those are require different levels of capability. So there's one set of things that are, if you have really stupid rules that are chewing up capability to implement, getting rid of stupid rules will pay off. That's one policy implication. Now, you know, the difficulty with that implication is that to some people, all rules look stupid. And I kind of think, you know, rules that say there shouldn't be lead in toys, I'm kind of in favor of. And rules that say you shouldn't put mercury in the atmosphere, I'm kind of in favor of. And rules against. So, so the first thing is, but you can't explain the East Asia success on the basis of they got rid of stupid rules. They did much more than that, right? The second thing is, what are the policy things that can be done with a basically narrow technocratic elite? given authority to run them. central banking. So you can avoid macroeconomic crisis, which the East Asian countries all did, all basically by delegating macroeconomic management to a narrow technocratic elite. So the second thing you should do is delegate. You should create institutions that can provide macroeconomic management, because macroeconomic mismanagement never did anybody any good. Right? Then the third thing comes, so the third thing comes is, should we pursue policies that actively give discretion to governmental agencies in order to promote growth, right? Now, the first thing to recognize about that question is that corruption is an industrial policy. After all, what's an industrial policy? An industrial policy is a, is a policy environment that treats some firms different than others in order to raise or artificially raise or lower the profitability of some firms and other. That's industrial policy. Corruption is an industrial policy. Corruption is a very effective industrial policy because when we institution, because it creates high profitability and makes people invest, right? So the industrial policy of Russia, like super fantastically successful in the last decade, right? Industrial policy of Suharto was actually kind of super successful for 30 years. But second point to recognize is that the debate about industrial policy has it completely backwards. The debate about industrial policy is says, should we give government discretion? Government has discretion. What weak institutions mean is that the government regulators can do anything they want under the guise of the law. So the second thing to recognize is that they already have discretion. The third thing to recognize is that most countries that have super low growth have it because the government is exercising discretion badly. So I am open. I, I, I've had this discussion. I work in an institution together with Danny Roderick, for instance. Danny and I have as much seminar every Monday, and we argue every other Monday, right? <laughs> because it's like, is it true that a well-implemented industrial policy could accelerate countries' growth rates? Absolutely, positively, yes. Is it true that some countries might be in a poverty trap such that without active industrial policy, they'll remain in a poverty trap? Absolutely, positively, yes. Are the countries in a poverty trap those countries that are likely have the capability to use discretion to implement industrial policy well? Absolutely, precisely, no. What kind of industrial policy do you want a country that can't give it a driver's license without corruption to have? Well, then the answer is a smart industrial policy that avoids the institutional weaknesses but still can have an industrial policy. I don't know how to do that yet. I'm thinking hard about how to do that, but I don't know how to do that yet. Did that answer your question? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so I'm perfectly open. I mean, this is my reconciliation of I'm perfectly open that industrial policy helped growth in Japan and Korea and Taiwan. Most countries that I actually work in, I don't recommend that they have their industrial policy because they don't have their capabilities. They don't have their politics. They don't have their bureaucracy. They don't have their tradition of meritocratic, technocratic control. And their private sector in a closed or deals environment already dominates policy making. Whereas in the East Asian case, you had a bureaucracy that initially was stronger than the private sector that it was leading. Whereas you can't have the government leading the private sector if, in fact, the private sector is leading the government. Right? Okay. Second question. Uh, Finn Tarp is here in the back of the room. Uh, and any question about the growth impacts of uh, aid, I would defer to Finn. But, um, which by and large is a huge debate about, I think, He's got the best, most recent evidence that suggests it's roughly kind of what we would have expected. That said, I think the answer has to be it depends on how the aid is structured. If aid is structured so that it reinforces the rent-seeking control of the government 
and reinforces the weakness of the institutions, it likely will have low impact, right? Even because the, what really increases growth is not spending on infrastructure, but infrastructure, right? No one drives on a budget for roads. <laughs> they drive on roads. So partly what weak institutions mean is you're incapable of transporting resources into roads, in which case foreign aid, unless it helps you solve that problem, though aid itself won't solve the roads problem. That said, aid poured in that does build, you know, aid that comes in that does build roads actually can have, you know, pretty substantial impacts on economies. And I think the mix of those two things is the complicated question that the design of aid has to deal with. So aid, you know, unambiguously, there are instances in which aid has failed and contributed to failure, and unambiguously there are instances in which aid has succeeded and contributed to success. So but it's contingent on how it interacts with the implementation capability of the countries at hand, and whether, it, and in some cases, it's actually worse than that. I think in some countries, it's actually, aid acts like a natural resource and allows a consolidation of political structures that otherwise would sort of be under more pressure to change. Right. Um, your question was conflict. conflict. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I think that's exactly right. But I think it's both endogenous, which is if you have a closed order deals environment and the primary return in any economic activity is, closed, is controlling rents, then to some extent you, you put more, you, you're going to put more stress on the democratic decision making mechanisms than they can actually handle. Meaning, you can only have an election if everybody can live with the outcome, right? But if you have all of the rents in the economy controlled by a few narrow people, uh, and they and you control the economy means you get to control the allocation of all those rents. People will fight about that. So the beauty of a rules environment is that it actually keeps rents low by having competition, which keeps the returns to political control low, which means people have democracies. So I do think these are all tied up. But I don't think I, I don't think that the conflict is necessarily exogenous. I think it, the conflict, I mean, so nearly every, uh, you know, if nearly every poor country has conflict, is it because conflict causes <coughs> poverty or poverty causes conflict? I'm kind of a poverty causes conflict guy. Um, you know, you know, my friend Ricardo Hausman, Venezuelan, and, you know, people then say, you know, oh, you know, Venezuela's growth decline was because it had weak institutions. And he's like, no, you've got it completely backwards. You know, at the peak of our boom, we had very strong institutions. But you know, you try having you try having your GDP and see how your institutions survive. Right? <laughs> we were trapped in an economic cycle that we couldn't get out of once it started into a spiral, and then we got conflict and we got political heightened political conflict and weakened institutions out of the downward spiral, not vice versa. Right? I mean, he always says. Take America and cut its GDP in half and see how long, you know, <laughs> how long it takes before you get even nastier politics than we have in America. Okay, should I take more questions or fewer questions? Time to <laughs> okay. It's time to stop. <laughs> so we thank you for the use of the Fascinating. Uh, it's kind of fascinating, and I like your way of marvelous.